see. As well as our Lieutenant Governor, Joshua Tenorio. We have with us in the Zoom room, GMH Administrator, Lillian Posadas. He'll be joining us shortly. We have the Public Health Director, Art St. Augustine. And I'd like to throw to Governor Lillian Guerrero for her remarks. Thank you, Crystal. Before I begin, it's my duty to report Guam's 10th COVID-related death. This morning, a 96-year-old female was pronounced dead on arrival at the Guam Memorial Hospital. In line with this protocol, all persons presenting to the ER are tested for COVID-19. That test returned positive. Please let's now take a moment of silence to share with those who have lost so much our deepest condolences. Just yesterday, we lost two more people in their long struggle against COVID. One of whom was my colleague and a longtime ICU and ER nurse at GMH. On an island whose fundamental values are rooted in respect for our elders, poor choices now can place them in the most danger. When we refuse to wear a mask around others, when we assume that our individual health must mean everyone else is strong and healthy, when we treasure our rights without accepting our responsibilities, we invite danger to the vulnerable, the manumko, the frontline worker, and the nurse. As of last night, we now have over 1,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. We have confirmed over 700 cases in the month of August alone. This represents nearly 70% of our total confirmed cases since this pandemic began in March. Our active cases now surpasses the number of patients released from isolation, a statistic we have not seen in months. At this very moment, while grieving for the loss of one of their own, our GMH nurses and doctors are training 26, are treating 26 patients for COVID-19. Hospitalization rates have drastically increased and hospitalization is not limited to our elderly. Just last week, we had our youngest COVID-related death at 34 years old. Let me be clear, unless we dramatically slow the spread of COVID-19, more people, more people, will die from this virus. Worst yet, people will die simply because we do not have the bed space or medical staff to treat anything but a rising tide of COVID-19 patients. For this reason, I have assigned Executive Order 2020-29 which will extend the public health emergency to September 30th, 2020. Executive Order 2020-29 will also extend the stay at home order until noon on September 4th. Under this order, everyone is directed to continue to stay at home with limited exceptions to include obtaining food and household necessities, going to and from work at critical businesses, seeking medical care, caring for dependents, caring for a vulnerable person in another location, caring for pets or exercise. Effective Saturday, August 29th at 12 o'clock p.m., some previously prohibited activities such as construction, 
banking, insurance, and other financial operations, and limited vehicle and real estate sales are now permitted. Banks, however, may operate at the start of business tomorrow, Friday, August 28. Religious services may be conducted in parking lots. However, participants must stay inside their vehicle during the service and personal interactions must be avoided. Religious organizations and congregants must observe all mitigation measures imposed by public health. Effective Saturday, August 29th at 12 o'clock p.m., all government of Guam parks and beaches will remain closed except for individual use for the purpose of exercise and individuals are subject to social distancing mandates. Public parks and beaches cannot be used to congregate or social gather. Make no mistake, you are our best tool against this virus. If we each do our part, if we each protect one another with social distancing, good hygiene and mask wearing, again, we will prevail. We live in a free society. We have rights, but we also have responsibilities. Every time we willfully violate a public health order, every time we refuse to wear a mask, every time we downplay the danger of COVID-19, we dishonor and disrespect those who sacrifice for us every day. More and more, I've realized that adversity introduces us to our true selves. It tests our core values. It makes us prove what we truly believe in. At its best, Guam's spirit is about we and not about me. We survive, we thrive even, because we now deep down, we know deep down that we are all in this together, always works better than you are on your own. We can't forget that now. We need to remember it now more than ever. Please stay home to stay safe and to save lives. Sizus Masi. I'd like to welcome Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio for his remarks. Um, half a day. I just wanted to add that the governor's actions are meant to have a structured, but it's a, meant to be a structured and deliberate attempt to reduce the amount of infections and to make sure our healthcare system can respond to those that are ill. And so I just want to support her comments and uh, pa pass it on to the other members of the panel. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Public Health Director, Art San Augustine, if you can turn on your video. Thank you, Crystal. I want to echo the uh, message from the governor. We are in full support of her message. I think what is significant is that she highlights our staying at PCOR 1, but also recognizes that as a community, She's entrusting that we have other additional activities that we can access so that we can sustain, sustain, continue to sustain our livelihood. And I want to say that really the governor, Lieutenant Governor and everyone on island, we've always continued and we will continue to ask for your continued support to practice social distancing even more than ever. Please do not be comfortable and say that you're when your coworker having lunch is okay to take off your mask and sit next and closer to each other than you would typically if you were social distancing. Maintain social distancing at the office. Wash your hands as frequently as you can. Disinfect your area. 
and wear your face coverings. This right now is perhaps one of the strongest messages we can send out to our community, along with the governor's directive with PCOR1. And I also want to remind the community that as one of the directors to the governor, public health and social services continues to allow our healthcare professionals to return home to continue their mission, critical essential healthcare functions. So that is still afforded and also critical services are also going to be continued to be afforded to our travelers returning to Guam. And so governor, Lieutenant Governor, thank you for the measures you put in place to help preserve and protect our island. And all we can really ask at this time is that we continue to, pre to persevere through this process and know that we will survive. Thank you. Thank you. Now I turn it over to Guam Memorial Hospital Administrator Lillian Posadas. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor and Art, uh, Director of Public Health. Um, I also um, echo the, uh, the uh, statements and the comments and the directive of the Governor and the Lieutenant Governor and Art. And uh, we have been for months now saying at the level of primary prevention to really just uh, wear your mask, exercise all the precautions to prevent the spread of this infection. Unfortunately, the numbers continue to rise and we see it. So now we are at a point to really emphasize the secondary primary prevention. And that is, if you start feeling the symptoms, don't wait, because that's what we're seeing in, in the emergency room is people are coming in after having fever, abdominal pains, um, whatever symptoms they're feeling that could be related to the COVID infection, they wait for days. And by that time that they come to the hospital, they're pretty, pretty ill. And so it takes a while. And so please, again, um, as it has been mentioned, to really be responsive, you know, be concerned about this COVID infection, because it is, um, it is happening. Look at the numbers that are, are rising and look at the number of people coming into the hospital needing beds. And, uh, you know, our, our resources are tapped as much as we have been prepared for this. It continues to tap our, tax our resources and our, our um, nursing and our healthcare professionals here at the hospital. You know, we're, we're exhausted. We really are. That's the truth. And yesterday with the loss of our uh, comrade, Comrade, the loss of our colleague, um, a soldier who is a nurse. Um, it pains us and we're saddened by it and we're grieving. The nurses are grieving, the, the, not just the nurses, but you know, the, all, everybody who's worked with the individual, we're grieving, but we're also needing to heal because we can have to continue this fight. And it's not just our fight, it's all of us. It's not just the hospital's fight, but it's all of us as a community. And as it was mentioned this morning, that you know we're stronger when we're unified, and not to be divided and against each other. But we have to be really unified, and adhere to these um, requests and these uh, you know statements that the governor has been putting out, and the lieutenant governor and all the other health professionals, the surgeon sale, the physicians advisory group, and, and all of us, we've been saying this, you know, to really take of all these warnings because we do not want to lose any any uh, any other person we don't want to it's just too it's painful to to see that the death of a you know a loved one the death of a comrade the death of a soldier to this uh, virus we can fight this but we got to be together we got to be unified to fight this thank you thank you Lillian I failed to introduce him earlier Dr. Felix Cabrera is joining us as well. He's from our surgeon cell and our physician advisory group. And I welcome him to share his presentation now. Thank you very much, Crystal. Happy day, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen uh, shortly and I just have a few slides just to give everyone a, an update on where we are uh, with our cases and the metrics that we've been uh, following uh, for COVID-19. Okay, so uh, starting with um, uh, this uh, first slide here, where we're looking at Guam's seven-day rolling averages for COVID-19 metrics. Uh, so this is data uh, as recent as uh, this afternoon uh, that we have. And so on the upper left, you see the daily new cases. And so the x-axis shows uh, that this 
Uh, this is basically tracking from the beginning of the pandemic back in March, uh, uh, middle of March. And as we go through, you can see that um, right, up, right off the bat, you can see in terms of the first wave that we dealt with um, and, and then subsequent uh, uh, upticks in, in new cases. But what we're dealing with, with right now is on a whole different scale. Um, and that at this, this point, we have an average of about 67.3 uh, new cases per day um, over a seven day average. Uh, you see on the markers here, I uh, have indicated also when uh, our, condition, uh, our pandemic condition of readiness uh, status changes and what that is. So of course we're in P401 right now as of August 16. Uh, on the uh, right, uh, upper right uh, corner, you see the test positivity rate. Uh, initially, this was of course a, a major struggle during our first uh, round with a, a P41, uh, but with our improved uh, testing uh, capability, we've been able to do much better as well as of course with the control of the, of the new cases. But as we go through, we've been steadily uh, increasing the amount of tests that we've been doing, but also still having an increase in our test positivity rate to the point where it's 9.0 at this right now. Ideal situation is to have it below 3%. Uh, anything above 10% is considered uh, extreme, uh, extremely poor control. Uh, so we're not there yet in terms of just the test positivity rate, but that's only one uh, side of the, of the picture here. So on the bottom right, you see a CAR score. And for those who are familiar with, um, with what this number is, is it's the COVID-19 area risk score. And this was actually developed for our quarantine protocols, uh, looking at other areas' CAR scores. Uh, but in applying it to ourselves, uh, you can see here uh, the scale right now is, is 0 to 15. Uh, you can think of this similar to a Richter scale uh, for an earthquake, where something below 5 is usually benign, and you may not even feel it. Uh, but as you go up higher, uh, it grows exp uh, in a logarithmic fashion. Anything above 7.5 is considered a high risk area. And unfortunately, we've been, uh, we did good, um, you know, as early as the uh, uh, early July, and then had been doing so well that we went into P43. But then as you can see, we've been slowly rising and we still continue to rise uh, to the point where we're at 12.2 right now. Uh, so very, very high. Uh, the CAR score does uh, look over a two-week period, not a, not a one-week period. Uh, so that will, there will be delays with, uh, with that number as it changes. Um, so now the part that on the lower left corner, which is the most concerning for, for everyone, and as we operate here on Guam with our, our fragile healthcare system, um, this is it being uh, stressed to the limit, uh, to which we've never seen uh, in, our, in modern times right now. Uh, you can see that back in the first wave, we did have an average seven-day um, census of, uh, of over 20 at that time. And then right now, we're at 23.3. But again, this is a seven-day rolling average, and every day uh, really matters. So what's included here is the current island-wide um, uh, And it's right today, it's equal to 38. And so 30 of that at GMH. Three at GRMC right now that are awaiting transfer to GMH, but uh, there are logistic reasons why uh, there's delays for that. And then at U.S. Naval Hospital Guam, they currently have five admitted COVID patients uh, there right now. Uh, so of course, this is our biggest concern uh, in terms, but it's also our biggest lagging indicator of, of the of our ability to control uh, the virus and and the ultimate uh, end outcome that we that we are most concerned about, which is the morbidity and mortality that this virus drives and that's represented in hospitalizations uh, in this case. The next slide I wanted to share here was, uh, was really looking at our mobility uh, in relationship with COVID-19 new cases and hospitalized uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, so just to get you oriented here, so again, this is an x-axis that goes the gamut of the whole pandemic beginning back in March. Um, on the left axis here shows our relative mobility of iOS devices. So again, this is Apple um, uh, iPhones and, and with uh, uh, location services enabled. Uh, and so it's an anonymized uh, sampling of, of, uh, of mobility throughout the island. And, and basically it starts off by just saying 100% is our pre-COVID mobility baseline. And then, and then everything, uh, each day it's recorded as a percentage of that. Uh, so Pre-COVID, we were above 100% as would be expected. And then after we uh, had our first case and then the first uh, set of mitigating efforts during uh, 
retrospectively was P41, uh, we uh, started to see a rapid decline. As you can see, a very steep decline in this uh, teal uh, green uh, uh, line here that represents the mobility and where we dropped to a baseline of near 40% of our origin of our baseline mobility. Uh, what you see, and then you can track it throughout the up until the present here. Uh, the purple represents hospitalizations. Uh, this, this here is also a seven-day rolling average, and then a uh, then the red being the new uh, cases. So this is just a general overview, um, and then I'll actually jump in a little bit more detail and uh, or, or focus view and and a, uh, hopefully a more simplistic view of what of what we're trying to demonstrate with this in terms of the relationship. Um, so this was then, back in uh, the first wave um, in March and April. And again, just to follow here, that on the left is the mobility, on the right is just the number of uh, the cases uh, that represents both hospitalized and new, uh, new cases per day. The mobility here, again, very steep drop, which was everyone's response. And basically, this is a way to track behavior and compliance with um, the executive orders from our governor mm -hmm. and the recommendations of public health. And so, so this is a you know a objective way to look at um, uh, the compliance of the island in terms of, of, of doing what we can to mitigate um, the spread of COVID-19. And as you see here, I, the 80% mark is is delineated here by the shading. And as what it's is you're trying to demonstrate here is that when did we drop below 80% mobility, and at that point, how long until our hospitalization peaked? And so that's what this gray part here is, is representing. And that's about a 15-day uh, timeline uh, from when that happened. So um, is that applicable to now? Um, it's the best thing that we got to, to help us predict where when our peak is going to be now. So let's go to now. Here, you can see uh, we went into peak core one on August uh, uh, 16. Uh, what's good to see here is that the, uh, we did reach uh, 100 back to baseline uh, uh, mobility, which was fine for peak core three, uh, but but then uh, it started to decline on August six, I believe, was the uh, the closure of bars at that time because we started to see this uptick in in new cases. But as you move forward, uh, the slope of, uh, the, and the rate of change of this is nowhere as close to what it was back then. How quickly people started to drop mobility dropped and people stayed home. Here, it's not as drastic, and that, that's a concern. Uh, that we have. And so we don't think that it's going to necessarily be this uh, um, 100, we're not, a, we're not confident it's going to be this 15 day window until we see a peak in hospitalizations, uh, but we pray it's enough. And so uh, time will tell over the next uh, several days whether or not our hospitalizations on the island truly does peak. Uh, and when it peaks, uh, will it go back down rapidly or would it just plateau? Uh, we don't know that yet. Um, and so, but this is our status right now. The solid purple line is the seven-day rolling average with the with the uh, the bars representing the actual uh, hospitalized on Guam. Um, the daily new cases here, it's even it's literally off the chart. Um, this, it goes up to 60 here, but uh, we're well above that in terms of daily uh, new cases. Uh, so um, this this here just kind of represents uh, the two different then and now. Uh, together and, and and the main take home from this one slide is just to look at the change in the mobility and how quickly we dropped back then and how slowly we've dropped now um, and so this data is up to august 25th so a couple of days ago so it does represent the beginning of this work week uh, and uh, that's the last of my slides thank you thank you dr cabrera i'll now open the floor for questions uh, due to time limit today, due to a really strict uh, schedule, all reporters will be allowed one question and no follow-up. First, we have Maureen Maritita. Buenas, everybody. Um, uh, I can see Lillian. Mm -hmm. I'm here. All right. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to answer this, um, but I, I'd, I'd like an understanding about um, testing, uh, which is one of our triggers. Uh, so um, uh, if, if perhaps um, uh, whoever feels it's relevant could address this. So um, 
so when when we test people um we're getting uh so for instance yesterday uh we're getting uh the number of samples tested and uh in our cumulative results we're also getting the number of new cases but uh from what i've been hearing there's um there's no correlation necessarily between those two numbers. So when we test people on island, what is the delay between getting the results? And is there anything we can do to better that so that we don't have community spread because people don't know they're positive? Um, in Japan, for instance, they're testing at the airport in a matter of two hours. So how can we do better? What is our situation? How can we do better? And what are we aiming for? What is the gold standard that Guam should aim for in testing? I think probably Art could answer that because public, public health is the entity for testing and he knows more about the time lapse between sample and results. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to the question with regards to testing, uh, we recently, uh, some time ago, perhaps a week or so, issued a joint information communication that we are shifting from mass testing for now over to target testing. And so our last specimens have significantly decreased from our uh, August 15th mass testing, in which we had over 1,400 specimens drawn in one day. So what's happening now is um, a multitude of things. Over the Northern Regional Community Health Center, we have Abbott ID machines there that we are using for testing. So results there come out sooner than when they go to the Guam Public Health Lab. We are receiving daily specimens from various labs and clinics. We run those at our Guam Public Health Lab. Uh, we have cleared the August 15 testing in terms of all the specimens. We are now sending out results on that. In the release that we sent out, it was about a seven day turnaround time. And so prior to the 1400 plus swaps that was uh, occurred on August 15th, we were hitting almost 48 hours notification time. But with the shift that we are going through now, which is target testing and working with some of our other partners in the clinics, we are trying to go back to 48 to 72 hours of notification. We also have two labs on contract that help us with testing, uh, DLS. And also more recently, we got into a contract with Guam Regional Medical Center. So we take some of our specimens from our Guam Public Health Lab and send them over to DLS and over to Guam Regional Medical Center. So we are really wanting to reduce the time from test to result so that those that are coming in that are close contacts, which we test at the Northern Health Center, and those that are symptomatic, that they Obviously, symptomatic, we can go, for example, to one of our local clinics who has an Abbott ID and they get a confirmation there. But if they're a close contact, we're asking they come to the Northern Health Center and then we can give them a test result. We're shooting for 72 um, hours from time of test. That's what we're hoping to get. And I hope that answers your question, uh, Ms. Maureen. So uh, what about the example that I gave to our testing at the airport? Is that something that uh, DPH, SS and the island should aim for? We, we did talk about testing at the airport. Uh, there are many different considerations working along with uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, as well as our med ops, our uh, physician advisory group. There was discussion about testing at the airport. There's also been more recent discussion about testing at the, Q, the quarantine facility, which we refer to as QFAC. So it seems that we may be shifting away from the airport and perhaps testing more at the QFAC. Uh, that's still under in, in discussion and uh, there's nothing yet been finalized until the final approach. Thank you, final. All right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Ed. Next, we have May Habib, PNC. Half the day, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, Governor, I guess this question is more for you. You know, a week ago, you were really adamant that everything had to stay closed, including the beaches and the parks, uh, even for individual exercise. We haven't actually seen the numbers drop at all. In fact, yesterday was our single highest uh, one day recorded. What is the incline and what is uh, dri the driving force between your decision to reopen the beaches and parks? You know, banks, I guess, is more understandable, but I'd like to understand the logic behind it. So beaches and parks, ma'am, are um, still closed. 
they are closed. They continue to be closed. But if you are uh, exercising and you want to run in the beach area, uh, you can. And so um, the restrictions hasn't really been lifted. I also wanted to say that individual exercise has never been prohibited. I don't know where people were getting that. It's just that you couldn't go to the beach because what we were seeing was people were socially gathering there and they weren't really using the beach and the parks to run or exercise. So individual exercise has never been prohibited. You can exercise in the sidewalk, you can exercise around your neighborhood, you know, but it, what I did in um, a week ago was just to reset the community. And as you see, as you saw, there were some essentials that I did not um, allow. And so now realizing that, uh, of course, these essentials are still um, only to be used for essential reasons and not to be used for anything else. And, uh, and uh, uh, they are uh, essential services that needed for uh, their, you know, for their maintenance of their well-being and their um, livelihood. And so, if you notice, I didn't really open a lot. I continued to close most. And again, parks and beaches are still closed. Don't think that because now you can, as an individual exerciser, run at the beach or run at the park, that it's open. It is only for, those re for that reason, and I have instructed our uh, police officers to make sure that they patrol the area and enforce it. Thank you, May. Jasmine Stolweis, Pacific Daily News. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to ask about capacity earlier. Governor, you wrote in a letter that uh, ICU beds are at capacity. Um, uh, can we get an update on that? What is the percent? Wise, where are we for hospital beds and ICU beds? And is the SNU facility being used at all? Thanks. So probably Lillian uh, can better answer that question. I can fill in in other areas, but Lillian is really the one that uh, is much more uh, adequate to answer that question. Thank you, Governor. And thank you, uh, Jasmine, for that question. In terms of our ICU capacity, what we just did uh, yesterday, uh, we, in the 14 bed second floor ICU, CCU area, we created a partition separating non-COVID ICU and COVID ICU. So in doing that, we added seven additional ICU beds for COVID patients. And the advantage for uh, you know, having that is that, that those beds have the capacity to do hemodialysis. And that was, what one, what, that was our, one of our challenges is that you know, when these patients who come in with the COVID condition and need ICU bed, they also need hemodialysis. And so if we, once we place them into that area in the ICU for COVID uh, patients, they can do dialysis two or three patients who need dialysis can have their dialysis treatment uh, there without having to be moved anywhere else. So those are the seven additional ICU beds for COVID patients. In the CARE 2 unit, which is just you know, across the hallway, we've had that CARE 2 unit designated as an ICU bed uh, for COVID patients. We initially thought that we could put five patients in there but you know, we realize that there's that one area that's just very small. And when the ICU patient is on a ventilator, it gets really, really tight in there. So we cap that at four. So that's care two, four beds, uh, four ICU beds. In the ICU, we have seven. So we have 11 total beds for ICU patients. If we need to 
If the census picks up for ICU patients, um, we also have on the third floor, which is our care floor unit, that's the third floor medical telemetry unit that we converted to care for. There's an area there that has six beds that can accommodate ICU level of care. So that's the six plus the um, 11. So we've got 17, oh, sorry, I can't even add anymore. Six and 11. So um, that, that is 17 beds for ICU patients. In terms of the overall uh, COVID capacity, bed capacity for just uh, regular patients who do not need ICU, again, in that care for unit, we do have beds that can be for telemetry or for regular medical patients. So that's a 26 bed area. Six of those can be used for ICUs. We have 20 beds for regular medical or telemetry patients. On the fourth floor, which is our care three, that's a 17 bed capacity that we have used for COVID patients and we can use again for COVID patients. So that's, those are a bed capacity in terms of for COVID patients. As far as the SNF facility, which is also what we call SIF, our COVID isolation facility over Barragata Heights, it has a capacity for 54 patients, 54 beds. However, right now we're trying to really resolve the chiller the air conditioning um, system. Uh, the chiller that we have that's been there for 25 years, we've been trying to get that replaced. Uh, we had it uh, repaired and it is running, but it is not sufficiently keeping the facility, the entire facility cool. So we still need to have a new chiller uh, procured and that RFP and the contract is, is ongoing right now. It's in review with the Attorney General's office. But in the meantime, we have in place or we're processing an immediate temporary chiller. That is just some a company that can put in or, you know, trailer or something portable that can then connect to the facility and keep it cool so we can open it up. That we're looking to see the proposal tomorrow. Once we receive the proposal, we act on it select the most economical um, vendor who then can provide and augment the, uh, the air conditioning system there. Hopefully by next week, we can then occupy it. But again, you know, we're, we're just hoping that this will, and that's the plan, is that immediate temporary uh, chiller system. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you. Lillian. Thank you. Next, we have Pacific News Center's Jolene Tobes. Yeah. Jolene, we can circle back to you. Next, we have Hit Radio 100's Nick Delgado. Good everyone. So I just want to first by start by sharing my condolences to the lives lost, uh, especially those just this week, especially to uh, condolences to Agabal's family and to the GMH team. She was in the hospital, we were, we were told from her family for several weeks for complications due to diabetes. She tested negative for COVID at least six times while in the hospital. A day or two before she died, she tested positive for COVID. So my question is, were those prior tests at GMH faulty or did she get infected with the virus while getting care at the hospital? And in addition, have has the hospital or has public health been able to identify how many other non-COVID patients have been infected with, with the virus while getting care at GMH? Ask uh, Lilian to um, answer that. Okay. Let me clarify, uh, Nick, you said the individual, is it the individual who passed away yesterday, was tested six times? Uh, that, that was the information we received from her family, yes, Lillian. This was the, the nurse, your colleague, Ms. Agabao, who we were told she tested negative for COVID at least six times, so multiple times. Okay. I did not know, I do not, I do not have that information that it was six times. But yes, she was admitted uh, into the hospital uh, for other uh, conditions. 
And so right now I, it's going through the process of contact tracing and it's still under investigation. So I don't have any other information to provide, but it, and also the thing is, I do not know that she was tested six times. That's not the information I received. Okay, and, and has anyone been able to identify how many other non-COVID patients uh, were infected with the virus it's, while getting treated at GMH? It's still ongoing the investigation and the contact tracing. Thank you, Nick. Next, we have Heidi Ueno Gilbert, Guam Bay Post. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I get to my question, um, a point of clarification, I think this would, could be answered by Mr. Art San Agustin. The test results that were provided last night were for samples taken on what days uh were they from august 15 and 16 and how long are the samples good for and isn't there a larger concern from public health that people were mass tested over 10 days ago and could have further spread the virus if they were positive because they're waiting for their test results that were expected in two to three days Thank you. Let me see if I can get to all your all your points. Uh, with regards to the testing, the integrity of the specimens are preserved. They are uh, frozen, and so if they are swabbed, uh, our lab has completed all the August 15 uh, testing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just got uh, updated information as uh, this was ongoing. All uh, complete and done testing of samples collected from August 15 through the 25th. As of last night, we have only 30. Uh, pending we'll specimens collected. I'm sorry. Speak louder. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, wanted to share. We got an update from the lab. Uh, they have completed and done with all testing of samples collected from August 15 through the 25th. Last night we have 30 pending specimens collected for the 26th, and they're being run today. And uh, any other specimens that are being collected today. Uh, in terms of your point that it took um, more than the hopeful gold standard of 24 to 48 hours. Yes, there was always a possibility that individuals who tested positive were in the community, but we also did ask anyone that was identified as a close contact to please self-quarantine until you get your test results. And the close contacts, again, are those that were in close contact to a positive confirmed case of COVID-19. And so I hope that I answered all your points, but if I missed any and I need to go back, please let me know. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, we have Thank Nestor Lacanta, KUAM. I don't see Nestor in the room. I'll go ahead and move on to his colleague, Adriana Cortero. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's taking care and doing well. Um, I wanted to add to um, a question that Jasmine had brought up about medical capacity. Um, you know, since the onset of COVID, we've known that um, Guam's medical capacity is incapable of treating an influx of patients. And as Dr. Cabrera just presented, daily COVID cases are off the charts and Lillian also stating that uh, medical staff is exhausted. So as this second surge is clearly hitting us, can you tell us where we are um, with calling for backup for medical assistance, um, you know, from the military, do we have any numbers on additional doctors, nurses, medical personnel altogether that could assist our healthcare system? So I have always been in close communication with the Admiral. Um, and so we are discussing and we have requested through the uh, administrative process of requests through uh, for our uh, medical assignment. And uh, Lillian and Dr. Cruz had gotten together to set up a, a staffing um, request. And I understand that there are requests for some uh, ICU nurses, and there are requests for some uh, doctors also, and respiratory therapists. And though that request has been sent in uh, to uh, FEMA and FEMA has uh, moved it on up to the higher ups, uh, the Admiral is uh, uh, also on his side running it up uh, his chain of command. 
And I do know that the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Esper, will be here tomorrow. And he is going to be meeting with our surgeon cell for the uh, purpose of discussing uh, staffing needs of Guam. The military has always been very um, um, forward with their uh, offer. And uh, as you know, the hospital tent is still here. And if we need to, they will stand that up also. Um, and so, yes, preparations have always been ongoing. We have also worked very uh, diligently to identify alternate care facilities for overflow. And those are uh, options that can be um, taken uh, advantage right away. So you're right. We have from the very beginning been preparing for a search like this. And so we have been covering all the bases that we need to cover to provide the quality of healthcare for our people. Again, our greatest concern with this um, increase of cases is it's overtaxing uh, and it's, um, uh, it's resulting. And the consequences are that uh, we, uh, we will have challenges in meeting the uh, illness needs and the treatment needs of people that come in as a result of being infected uh, for COVID. So Lillian can maybe give the exact numbers Lil, that you have requested. Mm -hmm. Yes, Governor. Um, yes, Governor, thank you. We did, uh, we completed the form for medical assignments and what we identified was uh, we need, if we could get 40 critical care uh, nurses, we've requested for critical care doctors and we have requested for our RTs. We've also uh, I've been in communication with the Department of uh, Education Superintendent, John Fernandez and his uh, nursing uh, team there. And so we're gonna be on a conference call in a few minutes with him to uh, iron out the details, but we've requested to at least have 10 of those school nurses because already some of them are helping public health. There's like about 18 or 20 of those nurses helping out of public health, which is great because, you know, definitely uh, they are a big help for public health. And um, we also met with uh, uh, a, one, of our, uh, one of the clinics here in Guam. Uh, and so they're looking to assign some of their nurses to GRMC. That way they can then take some of our non-COVID patients so we can decompress here at the hospital and open up those additional beds uh, that are gonna be needed for COVID patients. And so th that's where we are. We're reaching out to uh, UOG uh, student nurses to see how they can help out also, if not at least with contact tracing or some other ways um, to help us out. And I forgot to mention that uh, the school aides at the DOE were, will probably get some of them to just at least help us with uh, if not contact tracing, but at least with uh, turning patients, pushing patients in a wheelchair. The Guam Army National Guard, they're gonna be assigning um, from their medical unit uh, personnel, I believe about eight of them or 10 to come to the hospital and, and augment the nurses and the nursing team in the COVID care areas for like proning the patients, you know, turning them and proning them to help them with their respiratory uh, you know, their respiratory function to clear up some of those uh, in, in their lungs to improve the lung capacity. So that, those are what we're, do we're doing. Thank you. Moving on, Nestor Lacanto. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Um, so this uh, question is for uh, Dr. Cabrera. Just wanted to try to see if I could understand better uh, exactly the situation that we're in because it sounds like it's pretty bad. Um, the governor mentioned that uh, we've had in August alone, 700 cases, which is 70% of all total cases that we've had so far. Yesterday, we had the highest total um, we've ever experienced. Um, you said, Dr. Cabrera, that um, the hospital is, uh, active hospitalizations at 38%, which is a lagging indicator. Uh, and that um, if I understood you correctly, uh, the infection rate is directly proportional to mobility. In other words, um, the more people stay home, 
a lack of mobility, the, the, the faster or the more the infection rate will go down. But then you said that in this particular case, what you've seen so far is it's not doing that. So uh, I guess the question, if you could explain in more simpler terms where we are at, and if it doesn't work, this uh, stay at home order, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna do like um, Italy when, when they had it uh, uh, many months ago where they did a 100% lockdown uh, to kill the virus? Yeah, thanks for the question, Nestor, and, and for the opportunity to provide further clarification. So first of all, um, I wanted to say that the that it wasn't 38% capacity, is that the current island-wide census in terms of active hospitalizations is 38 patients. So that was 30 patients at GMH, three at GRMC, and five at Naval Hospital. Uh, so that was the, the, the 38. Now, the, the point that, um, that, were, was, that was trying to be made earlier in terms of the relationship with mobility and, and new cases and hospitalization is that when our mobility, 100% again being baseline, if we drop below 80% and we take that day and move it out about 15 days, then that's when we should hopefully see uh, at least a peak or plateau of, of, uh, of hospitalizations. We are still within that 15 day period. And that 15 day period right now will, will likely end around uh, September 4. So the reality is that we're going to continue to see these cases rise over the next several days. And in other words, the, the effects of, the, of us going into peak or one and going into a further uh, lockdown, so to speak, is that we, we, we won't see that full effect until, uh, until the first week of September. Uh, so that's to temper people's expectations about the cases that we're gonna see over the next few days in that in all likelihood, it's gonna continue to rise uh, before we start seeing it uh, get better. So it's gonna get worse before it gets better is, is the bottom line. As long as our mobility stays below 80%, ideally below 60%, which we're pretty close to at this, at this point getting below 70%, uh, that the more the better. So uh, with the governor's um, you know, uh, change in the orders uh, that's gonna be effective soon, I wanna make it clear that basically, as she said earlier, she pressed the reset button, but with these, uh, what seems like lifting of, of some restrictions is actually just going back to equivalent of what we were back in the end of March uh, to April. And we know that those mitigation uh, points worked back then and so uh, what she's doing is basically just matching that at, uh, in, a, in a very similar manner. Uh, what she did back uh, from last week was actually go even beyond that. And so that was for a one week period. And, and so, um, so I think it's reasonable that even though we're seeing, uh, when there is no expectation to see the cases um, uh, come down before making at least this call to go to this, um, the, 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 what we're familiar with as an actual peak for one. I hope that uh, that clarified uh, your question, um, and in terms of the delay. So again, we're still we're not yet um, uh, we're still in that window um, in terms of when we should expect to see the changes in in in, uh, in metrics uh, in terms of new cases uh, per day. Uh, we we probably won't see that downward turn until uh, a week from now. Thank you, Nestor. Johanna Salinas, Pacific Island Times. Half a day, everyone. Um, I have a question for a DPHSS. So uh, my question is um, about like online, there are some locals that are calling for Dr. Jana Mangwotnya to resign because of her comments that it's out of control because the people are out of control. So although um, she didn't say a particular race or ethnicity, some locals found her comments to be offensive. So um, what can a DPHSS say about these comments? Well, the huge thing about the comments is um, I could not have the opportunity to read them. Uh, been just like everyone else, very much in response with the COVID-19. Um, if there are any comments that are requiring to be dealt with, it would be a personnel matter. Otherwise, I want to say to many people in the community who have worked with Dr. Mengelonia, she has been steadfast. She's been here with us since March. She continues to support the Department of Public Health and Social Services in a key role as our medical director in response to COVID-19. I have no issues. Um, what she may have been referring to is the data, the data in the community. The data speaks for itself. 
it speaks to the behavior of our community, of our people of Guam, and that's what she's Carver House referring to. But I will review the information that's online. I will, if I need to, consult with her, bring her in and confer with her. But at this time, she has been a supporter, uh, advocate in our response to COVID-19. And um, she stands firm and ready to assist us. She assists as our medical director with the isolation facility, with the quarantine facility, all many aspects of our response. So I have nothing but praise and appreciation for the work she's done and she's given to the community of Guam. I find her not to be in any way um, singling out anyone on Guam, any ethnic group um, at all. Um, she speaks in terms of what she sees out in the community and data. And again, I say this, um, if there's any cause to discuss this further with her, I will. But at this time, I have to say that she's been a force with us in this department and I look forward to continue working with her. Thank you. If I could add to that, please. Um, so, you know, the reality is that, you know, Dr. Manglonia is like, feels like the, a lot of us physicians here uh, on this island where we, uh, and a lot of the healthcare workers where we feel uh, extremely frustrated that there's uh, not enough appreciation for how fragile our system is. And when uh, people have a me first mentality and, and, I, and in my understanding and my discussion directly with her one-on-one -on -one after uh, the, her, uh, her interview was that you know, she was very much uh, discussing the frustration in terms of, of, of the protesters uh, who were protesting the, the governor's orders and, and that uh, there was that frustration with that. And that was before we learned of the two deaths. And yesterday was extremely heartbreaking and you know, Marnette is, is a is a is a big part of the Guam uh, healthcare family here, and that she not only worked uh, you know most of her lifetime at GMH, but she also uh, uh, moonlighted at GRMC. So she's part big part of both hospitals' families. And so when we are struggling and losing our own people, you know, in this fight, you know, it, you know, it, it it takes it takes a toll on, on all of us. And and I I I share with her her frustration. And her, her plea to everybody to continue to, to do what you can to stay home and help us in this fight. Thank you, Johanna. Last Thank but not you. least, Jolene Tovez. Half a day, Governor. Um, I apologize for joining the conference late. Um, um, uh, my question um, is in regards to asymptomatic individuals. Um, now, the numbers have been rolling in, and I wanted to find out, um, does public health or Dr. Cabrera have an idea of how many asymptomatic cases um, are included in the count uh, to date of COVID positive cases? And how does understanding um, that asymptomatic people can also spread the disease. How does that impact our efforts to stop the spread of the virus um, on our island through the governor's lockdown orders? Sure so I can, can I just uh, quickly say, um, you're absolutely right about the asymptomatic. They are just as infectious as the symptomatic. And, the, and therein lies um, the challenge because if you're not experiencing symptoms, you think you're okay, but you're really positive and you're out there spreading it in the community. And so the biggest mit mitigation uh, action for that is to wear your mask and social distance when you're out there. Um, I'll have Art and or Dr. Cabrera talk about what percentage of the tests uh, results are asymptomatic or symptomatic, but regardless whether you're asymptomatic or symptomatic, that you have to continue on abiding and complying with the directives that we have put out because that's the only way we can stop this uh, spread in the virus. And that's what happened here. Um, it went into the community and uh, people who were asymptomatic but were positive were, were spreading it without knowing. Uh, and I'm sure there's no intention uh, of them to do that. But this is the whole 
um, challenge of this virus is uh, you can be asymptomatic and you can be infectious. So Art or Dr. Cabrera, you might wanna um, answer her question about uh, the percentage of those results. Are they symptomatic or asymptomatic? Um, I don't have the, the specific data for Guam itself in terms of the symptomatic versus asymptomatic. I will refer you to the, the SIT report, the situation report that's done daily uh, by public health and where they do uh, post uh, uh, on the first page itself, the first graph that you see there in terms of the, the illness uh, uh, symptoms and when and their time lag and when they were uh, um, you know when they were reported as first starting. Um, and so looking at that, that's one that's one uh, data that we have. But the bottom line is that again, about forty uh, about forty percent of those uh, people who um, who get COVID get it from somebody who did not have symptoms. Either they, they, they never develop symptoms or they just haven't developed symptoms yet. And so that's a key part there. And so the, the targeted approach is, is key in, in this and that there's a hierarchy and there's a stepwise fashion. In fact, we have a recommendation that there's 10 different uh, priority groups and how to go about. And so we have to go back to cert certain basics and it doesn't mean that we're not gonna do um, uh, any asymptomatic, we have to include some asymptomatic in, in the in the testing. It's just it's it's there's no argument about that. And despite what the CDC is recommending, our again because our system is so fragile here on Guam, we have to take additional precautions here, and that we will continue to test contacts uh, despite their symptoms, uh, you know, status, and that because that's a very very crucial uh, uh, tool that we have in our armament to to fight COVID and to get this under control. But right now, you know, the, uh, there's a fire burning in the building and the sprinklers are on, so we're gonna wet everything. Uh, and, then, and then we'll rebuild from there and, and go about and see what are, are, is a better targeted approach as we move forward. Once this gets under control, which we have faith will be, will be under control. Thank you, Jolene. Now for the governor's closing remarks. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you for the panel that's here today on this press conference. And thank you, um, especially for the questions that the media has posed and hope that uh, we have given you information to better understand the situation we are in. Uh, we are in very dire straits. We are in very desperate times and uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. And as your governor, I will not falter in any decisions that will directly uh, impact positively uh, in a positive way to help contain and help with um, preventing this virus to again um, take away some of the take away lives of our loved ones in this community. So I don't know how else to in. Uh, make an impact other than I appeal to your sense of uh, rationality, to your sense of compassion, to your sense of uh, respect for uh, our island and our people, and most of all for your love of family and friends so that uh, we can all unite together. We cannot afford being divided in this uh, desperate time. We need to be all together. And I totally respect people's rights. I totally respect um, people's opinions. Uh, but we all have to march to the same tune and form that barrier and hold hands and fight this virus um, till we can get it under control and contain. And we can do it. We've done it. We were there. We just need to, again, be committed and be very diligent. And I know it's gonna be difficult. The struggles are gonna be there. I know about our economy, I, but we can build back our economy. We cannot bring back the loved ones that have passed on. So please, I implore you as your governor, um, my agenda and my, my only priority is to protect our people, to get our island back to being healthy, because I'll tell you, our island right now is sick. And we all need to get together to treat 
the illness of our islands so we can all be healthy again, so we can have a healthy economy, so we can go out and shop, so we can go out and, and, uh, and, and patronize our businesses and build our economy again. So I ask you in this next couple of weeks to please do the struggles that we need to. I know the sacrifices are hard, but in the end, we will prevail. Thank you, and Sizus Masu. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe.